Good afternoon to everybody. We are a little bit late and we are in the last panel of this event. We we'll try to be concise but very productive in content. My name is Ernesto Feilbogen. There was a mistake. Used to be in Tranfa, but I am in Euroclima program, Euroclima Plus in Latin America, in charge of energy sector for the German Cooperation Agency. And now we, we want to deal with innovative solution in renewable energy. And uh, the first question is, what is, what does it mean to talk about innovation in renewable energy? Where is the innovation? What does it mean? I remember some years ago for us was like astonished to see a new wind park or some photovoltaic system, but we are getting used in the region also, Latin America, to see more often this kind of installation. It seems that innovation is going down in the system, smart grid regarding transmission and regarding demand side. What do we do with the energy? And it seems that new projects are fostering again more renovation, what renewable that we need in the matrix because always is a, a desire. To address this, those issues, we have here as the DOS authorized officer, project manager, public relations and marketing, Renewable Energy Hamburg, Hamburg Cluster Agency, very welcome, and Karsten Hasbach, Senior Director, Government Affair, Siemens Energy. Let me give you some words to later on give you the, the, the floor. The World Economic Forum is addressing that we need now more than ever in terms of the energy system, not to lose long-term objectives, but to address as well and simultaneously what is the short-term emergencies. We are going through a post-pandemic economic recovery that used to be, that happened to be faster than expected. And that created kind of this balance in the energy system in terms of supply and demand and the impact are in the prices. So. Those are things that need to be addressed. And one thing that they mentioned were, um, um, the World Economic Forum is in order to drive an energy transition in an, um, okay, <laughs> not our fault. <laughs> Didn't do anything. <laughs> not us. No. No. Okay. Spirits. <laughs> Spirits. I hope they like the presentations. Okay, in order to drive the energy transition in a turbulence atmosphere, we need a balanced approach. And they address some points, what they call a balanced approach. One that is very interesting that will open your presentation is the next generation of multi-stakeholder collaboration scheme. And then we are now with a representative of the Renewable Energy Hamburg Cluster Agency. Mm -hmm. Please share your contribution with us. And uh, you can see the slides now. Someone, I have to do it myself. Okay. So I already met some of you yesterday. I think all of you. So I will skip some slides. I wasn't sure about that. Um, so this is more like a little entertaining slideshow for you because it's already quite late and we have this wine tasting so i thought okay quick not dirty but interesting and to give you some impressions what innovations nowadays mean in the field of renewables and hydrogen because that was we like the plan we were talking about um before and esther and i on the phone um, we saw a tremendous development in the field of renewables, uh, not only in Europe, but also, as I learned, in Costa Rica, Guatemala, all over the world. And we started with wind energy, as I already told you yesterday. And maybe one of the most innovative things, innovative things in wind energy right now is floating, as you probably already know. Um, there is floating, I think, also in the Mediterranean Sea plant. There is floating plant around the United States. There is floating, for example, in Taiwan and Asia. So this is like the latest trend in offshore wind, so to speak. Um, here are some projects in the region of Hamburg. It's all with German names, so sorry about that. Um, you can see here that innovation is not only driven by big organizations like the European Union, for example, but also driven by like normal people, sometimes uh, by farmers, actually, here in northern Germany. 
So they have ideas. They started the whole business actually in the 1980s and 1990s with the first wind turbines here in Germany. So sometimes it's a good mixture, like the normal people and the big organizations supporting them afterwards. This is probably the most famous project right now in Hamburg. It's called the Green Hydrogen Hub. It's in the harbor area. I don't know if you went there yesterday, maybe, or you walked around, maybe on your own. So this is a very um, prominent and very important project supported by the European Union, hopefully. It's a line of IPSE. You probably know that better than I do. There are a lot of companies involved. You can see some logos here. It's not only like Hamburg-based companies, but also very international ones. You see the Shell logo here, Mitsubishi. And it's actually about a network of hydrogen. So um, it's not only producing, but it's also about transport. It's about different types of transportation, for example, airplanes, uh, boats, so on and so forth. So I have the colleague here from Siemens Energy, so he can tell you more about shipping and everything, as I know. And this is a project which is a bit older, actually, from the field of industrial waste heat, for example. This is, I think, four or five years old. So we use um, surplus heat here in the harbor area as well. So this is maybe like the um, underlying idea to use things or energies which are already there, like to profit from the whole system. And yeah, I will skip that one. Here we have another like um, line um, for research um, supported by the Ministry of uh, Economic in Berlin. It's called Reallabor. This is a German expression. It's a bit hard to translate that into English. So we say sandboxes or real laboratory, whatever you want. It's a little bit like big experiments to show like the overall picture. And we have one here in Hamburg. It's called Norddeutsches Reallabor, meaning Northern German Real Laboratory. And it's also about decarbonization of the industry. So this is like a very quick overview. And if you want to know more, as I suppose, you can always ask afterwards, as I already told you yesterday, we have several colleagues only dealing with innovation in our agency. So if you have maybe some potential partners or companies or whatever interested in more projects, please contact us. We are very happy and willing to help them and to connect to other partners. Yeah, that's about it. <laughs> Thank you. Just for a good starting, we will see later. And uh, the European Union Central America Association Agreement has a report on renewable energies that was launched, I think, at the end of last year. And they show a high remaining potential in terms of renewable in the region, in the region, Central America. And they also suggest to pay attention to the demand side and also to new business models and they address electromobility, green hydrogen, as everybody does, um, low enthalpy geothermal energy storage, smart grids. GIZ, in collaboration with H2LAC, also has a report that was launched February this year. And they say, because of the availability of renewable sources, we can produce in the region very competitive hydrogen. Is it, is it enough to have the resources to produce competitive? What about transport later? What is the profile we want to get in our countries in Latin America? Talking, rem rem remembering the word we use in renewable, are we going to be producers, consumers, or prosumers, which is the role? And I think you do have some examples on that sense, Karsten. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> buenas tardes. And, uh, <laughs> First of all, uh, thank you very much, Ernesto and the organizers for the invitation today. So it's a privilege for me being here. And I know my situation. I'm now in between you and the wine tasting. So I try to make it as quick, uh, as short as possible. Um, but uh, before I forget, so if there are any questions, I will be here also for the wine tasting. Uh, maybe ask them at the very early stage. I don't know how long the wine tasting will be. <laughs> Um, good. So I'm uh, from Siemens Energy and uh, representing uh, uh, from the government affairs side, the region Latin America, which is one of our very important and very focused regions. 
And um, before coming to the answers to some of the, your questions, Ernesto, let me maybe give you a short overview about our local footprint in Latin America. So Siemens Energy is a spin-off of Siemens AG. We are now two completely independent company from one another. And uh, we have been in, in, C, uh, in Latin America, including Central America, in most of the countries for more than 100 years. Uh, overall, there are roughly 5,000 employees, 13 countries. We have 12 factories across uh, this region. And um, this is only showing one part of our world or our group. So I've not added the Siemens Gamesa part where we are having 60% uh, of shares in, and we are currently acquiring the remaining, or we try to reacquire the remaining 33%. So we could easily add some additional 2000 employees and factories in, in Latin America. So, but when I saw the figures and, 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 and heard the interesting uh, statements and comments this morning, I mean, to give you an insight on renewables with an energy mix of 98, 99%, this is, I don't, say, I don't want to say it's a challenge. Actually, it's Europe that has, or other parts of the world that have to learn from you, yeah, how you integrate it and how you, uh, how you develop a huge renewable uh, energy mix in your energy landscape. But we know who thinks. We know more, but I just want to stress on two. First, the energy consumption and demand will increase by factor two until 2040 worldwide. Second, we all know climate change is real. So I heard today the impressive number of that Guatemala is the source of 40% of the sweet water to Mexico. Um, but we also see in regions when the summer is very long and dry, that probably those resources yeah, do not become as reliable as we would like them to have, right? So we have to also to consider reliability of an energy system. And um, <clears throat> in my next references that I would like to share with you, and don't worry, I'm not talking about solar or wind, there you are the experts, you can teach us how to do that. Um, it is more the applications and I'm looking for it. We are, we are looking uh, to it from two perspectives. One is how does it help each country to decarbonize? We heard about electric vehicles. Those vehicles need electricity. And in ideal case, it doesn't make sense to, 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 to come with some, let's say grayish energy around the corner and to drive an electric car. So the entire value chain should be green. When talking about cargo, especially trucks, then batteries at this moment in time, there will be for sure an advancement in the development, but in this moment in time, it doesn't make sense. So here, for example, hydrogen could, or derivatives of hydrogen could play an important part. And uh, one of the panelists uh, mentioned the railway um, which where you can choose at the moment either to use diesel to electrify which is for this distance we are talking about quite quite an expensive price tag and i know this because i used to work for siemens um, or you could even think to say let's make it green and use locomotives not not fueled by diesel but by hydrogen they're already on the market and then then it would be green um yeah coming to the coming to the uh, <clears throat> examples i wanted to mention so the first one you probably heard of it's a green hydrogen uh, project in uh, currently happening in Chi uh, in chile it will go operations in two months from now called haro oni it's in patagonia so uh, starting from wind energy producing electricity or green electricity this being transformed into green hydrogen and this being transformed processed on site into synthetic fuel the fuel it will be shipped to europe 
and will be used in Porsche sports cars. Uh, why Porsche sports cars? Because Porsche is one of the uh, partners in this pilot project. And they also want to demonstrate that with synthetic fuel, without a CO2 footprint, you can still run combustion engines, which is very important for their, let's say, loyal customer base, that they can continue to run their, their nice cars for the next years or decades to come. Another project in the, um, in the green aged uh, hydrogen uh, arena, we are currently developing jointly with Ecopetrol in Colombia where we generate uh, green hydrogen, or we will plan to generate green hydrogen, which is partially then being used in the refinery process of Ecopetrol itself to make the process of the oil and gas business in the refinery green or more greener. Um, and the other half is planned for being exported. And maybe due to the time, I will simply stick to those two and so it's on the one hand side a tremendous opportunity and you know the term sector coupling so meaning where from green or from renewable energies why are turning the electron into a molecule you have later on various options what to do with it i mean what doesn't make sense is to take the molecule really and then to bring it back uh, to generate green, uh, electricity out of it, um, at least at the moment, because the price is simply too high. But you can process it, the green hydrogen, into e-ammonia. E-ammonia is one of the main components for fertilizer production. Countries with a huge agricultural sector yeah, become less dependent of importing, usually for hard currencies, ammonia in order to produce fertilizer. Second, and we should not forget what is currently happening in Ukraine, Russia, or let's say in Ukraine mainly, is to be also a little bit more independent from supply chains and from suppliers. Things, parameters can change, believe me. I used to live and to work for 12 years in Russia and, and until the night of the 23rd of February, I said, no, it, it's not going to happen. Yeah, we learned our lesson. Yeah, and um, it's now a really painful experience. And uh, don't get me wrong. Um, it's even worse and, 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 and my deepest respect for the people in Ukraine uh, who, who suffer for their life on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, but it makes clear, and here we are only talking about energy and certain materials, this can happen any moment. Yeah, there is no guarantee. Meaning, if, you, if your nation, if your GDP, if your living standard depends on certain sectors and industries, it is really vital, and maybe the Ukrainian examples, now really opened everybody's eye to be independent and to have ch choices in order to continue as you plan. So, <clears throat> and the nice impact of uh, green hydrogen projects is also the ability of scaling up in a very fast way. But um, we are also very, very careful as a technology provider, you know, to do it stepwise, to start with a smaller project and then learning the lessons, experiences, and then scaling it up. If you start, and we hear at the moment also ideas of projects of giga gigawatts capacities, um, first of all, maybe it will be challenging to find a supplier for electrolyzers in this amount. Um, second, it will be interesting to see the business case behind it. Because, the, as you know, the difference uh, of one kilogram green hydrogen is uh, and, and gray hydrogen that is six dollars to uh, two US dollars, it will pay off. And it, within the next seven to ten years, we expect that the prices will be at the same level. And that, that doesn't mean that the gray hydrogen price will go up. No, the green one will come down. And you are in a blessed region of this world and, and this planet. You have 
many hours of sun, very reliable, good wind conditions. You have a lot of water, ideal conditions. Yeah. Um, but even those parameters are not stable and reliable, meaning in order to back up your energy system, um, there will be at least to our assumption for the next 30, 40 years, also fossil fuels to a certain extent be necessary. Um, as an example, high efficient gas fired power plants to provide energy and electricity when it's really needed, when the sun is probably not shining, when the wind is not blowing, um, or when the grid needs balancing, right? So the, the next one is also the grid side. And, and, and um, I can only underline what the, the speakers before me said. Uh, you did a tremendous job in the Central American countries regarding the grid uh, and the modernization, because this new world of being producer, consumer uh, at the same time, and the electrons do not go this one-way street as we know it from the past you know, there sometimes the you need electricity you receive it but with your wind or a solar park you can also generate if you have a surplus you feed it into the grid um, so you become the producers um, they need to be smart they need to be efficient and most important also they need to be safe in terms of uh, being safe from cyber attacks from outside because you do not want to have someone else in the world uh, being able to switch on switch off the light in your let's say in your energy system or in, in, in your country so now um i think i already overtook it right Thank i will you. skip Thank the you, rest <laughs> I was asked first to open the floor to the audience. If there is some question, we do have 10 minutes. I will make it five minutes. If there is any question, I do have my own questions, but please, you're very welcome. Or somebody online. If not, I do have two small for each of you. Uh, it was mentioned by Luis, and you are talking about hydrogen in terms of local production consumption and some exports. What about green hydrogen certifications? Have you seen that as an obstacle? Dena Deutsche Energieagentur made a study. 11 systems are working all together. This is one question. And to close uh, this panel, tell us a little bit more about your cluster because maybe very interesting for the region, please. Ladies first. Oh, oh yeah. Yes. Okay, yeah. Uh, I think I told a lot about the cluster yesterday, so maybe it might be boring for some of you, but I think I didn't tell you a lot about like how we support innovations in the cluster, and that was like the main topic for this panel. So actually, we have an award each year. It's called the German Renewals Award, and if you look at our website, for example, you will find all the reviews of the last 10 years and it's very impressive to see like what students invented for example for renewables what like different companies did in that field for example Siemens also won the award at least once maybe more times so um, this is actually a very important goal for our cluster to foster innovation and have this cooperation between companies universities and politics like the three groups involved like in yeah like innovations of course so, and there are a lot of activities, as I told them yesterday, a lot of networking events, um, research projects, um, a lot of marketing. So it's, it's typical association work or Verbandsarbeit, as we call that in German. And I think it's very important nowadays because um, due to the Ukraine crisis, as my colleague mentioned, like the whole world of energy, not only in Germany, is um, very I don't know how to say that it's it's very volatile. I mean, it's a lot of changing all of the time. It's incredible what happened uh, ever uh, since the Ukraine war started in February. So we need innovation. That's very important to get this um, energy transformation done and to be independent because that's the lesson we all learned. Yeah.
a certification of, let me call it <clears throat> a product is of course also relevant, but maybe as this whole ramp up of the hydrogen economy is only about to start, we should not be too dogmatic here. Um, I know the, uh, let's say, the, 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 the position of the German government, especially if it comes to funding and financing of products. Um, this is at the moment only possible in combination with green hydrogen products uh, and projects. Nevertheless, uh, if the experts have, or if the experts are right, then we will need tremendous amounts of hydrogen in a very short time frame. And we should really a little bit open the discussion on regarding uh, the type of the color. I mean, we, meanwhile, you have the entire rainbow almost for any kind of, 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 of hydrogen. Of course, if we want to, to, to succeed and, and, and to be successful in climate change and want to realize the, the targets of 1.5, at the end of the day, we really have to come to a point where this, the emission will almost disappear or will be neutral. But of course, we should also not forget one of the largest nations uh, committed only in 2060 to be commission neutral or uh, net zero. So meaning if we make two, three, five percent uh, improvements, that does not make, does not bring a lot to the entire game. Anyhow, it also makes it at the end a very important, if we have certain standards uh, that ensures a quality and that also ensures that the overall value chain and then and the big picture we have in mind and the big, let's say, vision we have in mind, that it will be really reached. Um, yes, we will need standards, but I would not, before I even have the first larger amounts of, 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 of industrialized standard products on the market and uh, to stop this development by the discussion, what is the right standard? Thank you. Then we are only one hour and 15 minutes late in terms of the agenda. Thank you very much, <laughs> Astrid and Karsten, and we give you the floor for next conclusions. Well, thank you very much. <laughs>